So uh, you probably all know that I'm Sarisha, I'm the founder of the Sustainable Alpine Tourism Initiative, which actually started kind of three years ago now. I think now we're in 2021. Um, and really the purpose of it was to bring together lots of different stakeholders that need to collaborate on sustainability across mountain regions. Um, and I think the, the more that we do this project, the more I'm learning that there's so much potential for collaboration and, and knowledge sharing. Um, and so, yeah, I'm really delighted to bring you all here together today from wherever you're dialing in from around the world. Um, just a quick, quick note uh, of, of hopefully that you can all join. But on the screen throughout the session, you'll see quite a few QR codes appearing. And those correspond to either connecting with speakers or connecting with each other. So the one that you'll see on the screen now is a QR code to connect to the SATI LinkedIn group. And the idea of that is to really try and get the discussion going after the event as well, and also keep some of the dialogues that you might have in the breakout rooms, because I think that's been a real strength of SATI so far that we've got this kind of um, collaboration across uh, lots of different regions and, and lots of different expertise. So with that, I'm going to introduce the panel. Um, so thank you so much panellists for joining me today and, and also the facilitators. So in terms of for the session today, we're really trying to address quite a progressive vision for the outlook on sustainability in alpine tourism, but also more broadly in mountain regions, because as many of you know, in many places across mountain regions, tourism is the economy and the economy is tourism. Therefore, I think the two are, are very um, closely interlinked. And in terms of today, I'm delighted to welcome our panel. So we have Carolina Adler, who's the Executive Director of the Mountain Research Initiative. Um, we've got Steve Evans, who is a very um, well versed and, and expert on circular economy, and he's the Director of Research in Industrial Sustainability at the University of Cambridge. And um, I met Steve through the Masters that I just finished, um, and he was a, a great source of inspiration for these study sessions as well. We have Ingrid Zimmerman, who is an expert and representative from the Austrian Federal Ministry of Tourism, Agriculture and the Regions. Um, and we also have Gavin Fernie Jones, who is the founder of One Tree at a Time and also a real pioneer in terms of social entrepreneurship around environmental sustainability in particular. And joining us in terms of the panellists are our facilitators for the breakout session. So the way that SATI sessions usually work is we have a panel and then we have a breakout session to delve into some of the topics a little bit further with experts from different areas. So we have two experts today. We have Jim McNeil, who is a circular economy and tourism researcher. And we also have Pamela Resolute. Ravasio, sorry, um, who's the founding director of Sherahim. Um, and she's a real expert in terms of outdoor sustainability and has worked with many brands on that over the years. So um, the session was just going to start initially with a bit of a kind of look back in, on the recommendations of SATI from 2020. So the series began in the September. Initially, we were going to have a physical event, but like everything else in the world, COVID obviously stopped that. Um, and actually, it's been a blessing in disguise to some extent because we've ended up having a really diverse conversation digitally and, and connecting with lots of people. So in terms of the themes that I wanted to just share with you, and my real key takeaways from last year and then recommendations for this year, just a, a quick two minutes on um, the, the key standouts from my perspective. So I think tourism redefined was a really important theme. And by this, it was really about how looking at for this year, how can destinations take responsibility in terms of sustainability on tourism? And one thing that really stood out was the localization dialogue. So it's really essential that as we look in this admittedly very difficult environment of COVID, and I think there's been a lot of announcements this week in particular that have exasperated that, we move to understand how the local identity of a region could actually support some recovery pathways going forward. And I think that's going to be quite critical looking at the first two quarters uh, of this year and, and going into the rest of this year as well. Um, differentiated business models was really quite a key theme as well. And by this, we really had a strong uh, emphasis on resiliency. And by that, it was to do with how some regions are very focused on winter tourism alone. And I think given the long term risks of climate change and also the immediate short term risks posed by COVID, there's a need to really try to diversify business models and look at holistic tourism all year round. So that was quite a key theme. 
Um, the other two things on tourism redefined is nature based tourism. So this was a very strong theme that came out in terms of connecting with consumers, um, but also connecting with the, the local resources in the area. I think historically that's maybe not been something that, that regions have sort of tapped into in terms of an identity and a, a service for tourists. But that's something that, that was quite important. And, and finally, in that space, community engagement, especially with young people. I think in this current environment, there's a lot of um, difficulty in terms of their future employment opportunities and really feeling like they have a share of voice. And I think SATI this year will really address that. And actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit later about how we're going to be doing that. Um, just very roughly on, on the last two themes of circular economy as a value creator. And that really stood out because I think one thing that resonated with me so much was was one of the sessions we had where where we said actually you know a hotel why doesn't it look at itself as a service-based model outside of its immediate customer base so could you actually become a community hub where you have sessions on social openness if you have sessions on local culinary um, expertise from chefs that come in music nights cultural kind of um, events that that promote the region and and also a shared experience with the customer where you try to explain why sustainability is actually important for them to connect with. So that was really about looking at the potential to turn circular economy value on a process side into circular economy on a social value. So quite an interesting dialogue there. Um, the other thing was around subscription models. So that was really interesting in terms of understanding where um, there's potential to innovate in terms of some of the business models. And, and Gavin's actually going to touch upon that a little bit today in, in some of what they're doing um, at One Tree at a Time and, and the shops that they've got as well. Um, and then finally, innovation was very critical. So there was a lot of discussion in the infrastructure session in particular on big data and the role of big data to actually improve energy efficiency. Um, the same on the hotel side in terms of managing the environmental footprint. Um, and finally, on the energy front, I think there were some really fascinating discussions around the potential to use technologies such as hydrogen in um, snow groomers, because in, in many resorts, up to 90% of the emissions on a mountain are actually from the, the, peace, uh, the peace groomers. And so I think there's, there's some moves there in, in places like France to start doing that. And I think that's quite interesting to understand where that will go forward. Um, and finally, on the new energy model, solar was really critical. So we, we had a, an interesting discussion about the idea of community um, funded solar and whether there's a model there on, on sharing the energy grid to decentralise some of those solutions. So, yeah, that's that's the kind of overview of, of what SATI really um, came out with in, in 2020. And I, I will be producing a report um, in the coming weeks, which I'll share on the LinkedIn group as well. Um, so, yeah, I'd, I'd encourage you all to, to join that group. Um, the QR codes at the top of the screen um, and yes, yeah, they connected with the dialogue. Um, we will discuss the 2021 plan a little bit later, but essentially it's really building on the themes that I've just discussed um, and trying to move into more of a workshop model as well, because I think the breakout sessions were really um, an, an arena that people felt was the most valuable for them um, in terms of liaising with the experts, but also being able to debrief a little bit. So yeah, that's that's the kind of rough overview. So do please get in touch, stay connected, and, and I think um, check out the other sessions. So with that, I'm going to actually move to Carolina. So Carolina, thank you so much for joining today. I think I've been following the work of the MRI for many years actually now, and I think I'm always in awe at the incredible research and the, the programs that you, you have there. So I wanted to start by asking you, why do you think knowledge creation systems are important in terms of connecting stakeholders across mountain regions? Um, I think in, in my own research, I found that that was seemed like it was quite a critical part of scaling up sustainability. But I wondered if you could share with us your perspective on that. Wonderful. Thanks a lot uh, for that introduction and for the, the recap of, of where SATI has got to, to now. I think that's also very valuable to keep in the back of our minds. Um, the question you pose about knowledge creation and, and to think about it in terms of a system, I think it's very critical. Um, sustainability itself is a is a not only a, 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 has a normative dimensions, uh, but is it's also a very complex um, term. Uh, but also aspiration for how we manage not only our resources, but how we interact uh, with each other and with, uh, with the places in which uh, we live, work and um, 
gain our uh, resources, for example. Mountains are uh, unique in that sense because mountains provide a very specific context in which we not only experience global change phenomena such as climate change, um, but also a very important um, uh, spaces in which we can uh, demonstrate how sustainability can help address some of those uh, key global challenges. Um, but sustainability being complex means that we also need to be taking a very broad uh, perspective on the sorts of uh, inputs uh, and knowledge bases that are necessary for developing uh, sustainable solutions uh, in the mountain space. So, for instance, we not, not only need uh, the inputs of the research community uh, to be able to understand how these systems work um, and how they interact and the feedback effects each of them, uh, the components have on each other, um, but also it's important to take into account uh, the, the, the local communities, what their wishes are, what their aspirations are in terms of uh, a sustainable uh, future, what does it look like for that particular region, um, and also for, for in, in a policy space, uh, we do need to recognise that there's a need for, um, uh, I guess, acknowledging that there's a trade-off between what is best for the environment and, and sustainability outcomes uh, versus also uh, what's possible, feasible and desirable from a socioeconomic perspective. Um, and these are important considerations and uh, dynamics to, to consider. Um, so therefore, uh, linking all of these uh, knowledge inputs is really important. Um, and therefore why we need to acknowledge also the role of networks. And for instance, the platforms uh, that you are creating here precisely because it gives us an opportunity to connect with people with whom we wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to connect with. Um, the MRI has been around for 20 years, as you've mentioned, it's a network that spans um, uh, all mountain regions of the world with up to, uh, at the moment, we have just over 11,000 expert uh, um, uh, members enlisted in our experts database, mostly researchers, but increasingly we see now uh, also um, practitioners and, and policy makers uh, that have expertise about how we understand the mountain system and also how to um, enact on solutions on it. Um, and so given the history that we've had in connecting mostly the research community, we are now seeing a trend where we also need to connect with the practitioner world and we are learning immense about that. Um, and this is why it's so important, I think, uh, for the to address the complexities for, of sustainability in general, we do need to broaden also the links uh, to different perspectives and um, inputs on what works on the ground. Thank you. That's fantastic. And I think you've got such a wealth of experience in terms of your understanding of those knowledge networks. I found the trade off point really interesting that you just mentioned, because my own background is as an economist and, and I work full time in sustainable finance. And I think I see very often that the finance world needs to kind of engage with outside of the finance world to be able to de-risk some of those solutions and ensure that those trade offs are not as amplified as they currently are and, and try to really um, understand the the challenges on the economic side of the model as well um, and I think that's going to be a really interesting narrative this year as we look ahead to COP because finance is actually one of those five themes of COP this year in, in terms of scaling up those solutions um, so thank you so much I think that was really fascinating it takes me really nicely on to Ingrid so Ingrid thank you so much for for joining us and I know I've, I've been in discussions with you and the team and in, in the ministry in Austria for quite a few years now actually um, and I think I'm I'm really intrigued at your policy perspective because I think it, in terms of tourism policy in Austria which is obviously a country that is heavily um, heavily uh, impacted by tourism and, and many parts of the economy especially winter tourism rely um, quite a lot on that policy perspective so in terms of the plan t which the austrian government um, has implemented to address environmental and social sustainability could you share with the audience a little bit about that and your perspective um, in terms of the environmental um, and social sustainability included in that plan thank you sarisha for inviting me in and that i can share um our views from the Austrian government point of view. 
Um, as you said, uh, the Austrian government has uh, launched a new tourism strategy, the Master Plan for Tourism, Plan T, in 2019. And I have to say it was really um, a strategy which was designed in a very participative approach. Uh, we included all stakeholders uh, from all levels, also, of course, from the regional levels. Because it's important to know that uh, in Austria we are a federal republic uh, consisting of nine federal states and actually tourism lies within the competence of these uh, federal states. So our um, task as a government is to provide a common strategic uh, framework to coordinate the regional tourism policies. And that is what we try to do with Plan T. And as you said, at the core of our uh, tourism strategy lies sustainability. It is really uh, a key element, sustainability in all uh, three dimensions in the ecological, economic and social cultural dimension. And uh, so what do we mean by that? It is, uh, we mean that the focus of our tourism policy is not only anymore on the visitor only, but also on the local communities and on the environment, of course and also, of course, on our entrepreneurs and uh, the employees. So what do we mean? I mean, uh, when we say that the, we focus also on our local communities, um, we want that our tourism destinations uh, become high quality living environments um, where the guests, but also the local population feels fine. And therefore we need a stronger involvement of the local population in decision processes at the destination level. And we really have to take care that all people can profit from tourism. Um, uh, taking care of the environment, of course. So we deal with our natural resources in a very respectful way. We have um, also to counteract wrong developments in time, especially when combating climate change. Uh, through uh, instruments and initiatives uh, starting from energy saving in, in accommodation until sustainable mobility and uh, generally careful, carefully dealing with also foodstuffs, uh, ensuring their regional origin and, and high quality, etc. And then, of course, we need to consider the needs of our entrepreneurs. Uh, in Austria, most of our um, tourism businesses are small and medium sized enterprises more than 90%, most of them are actually family run, uh, which is a tradition in Austria and which is very important uh, for uh, in terms of hospitality. And so we have to support these uh, SMEs so that they can remain economically stable, uh, sound enterprises to provide uh, the right framework conditions so that then ca they can make investments and also invest in innovations. And of course, uh, the staff members, uh, it's important um, to have high qualified uh, employees in tourism. It is important that we can keep and also uh, regain actually the staff in the tourism industry, because especially now in the Corona pandemic, many people uh, employed in the tourism sector now are starting to turn away uh, looking jobs elsewhere. So we really after this crisis have to try to regain and motivate them to work again in the sector. So um, this is um, really for us a paradigm shift. And uh, finally, we really have to take account uh, of the responsibility tourism has also globally and uh, also, for example, in trying to implementing the sustainable development goals. And that is why we really took care to anchor sustainability in the new uh, strategy. Amazing. Well, I think it's it's fascinating to hear um, some of your perspectives at that kind of regional and then local level as well. I, I wrote my thesis uh, last year on how can circular economy be applied or to family owned enterprises that run hotels in Austria, because there, there really is an interesting cultural perspective in that. Often I found that the, the knowledge of the family could actually be shared with the next generation, but those intergenerational dialogues are very different. So the younger generation could bring something around the sustainability practices, but the older generation are bringing the kind of cultural heritage um, of the business. And I think those two approaches together are really fascinating. And, and I think the 
equality point that you mentioned is really important too. I think that's often something that people don't necessarily jump to on the SDG agenda when it's concerned with mountain regions. But I think in many of those communities, it's really critical that we do have an understanding of the current um, potential inequalities between um, the the opportunities that people might have and, and what's required. So yeah, I think it's, it's really fascinating to hear your perspective on that. And thank you so much for sharing it. Um, I'm just going to move across to Steve Evans now. So Steve, um, I know we've had lots of discussions over the last few years on, on some of these themes and, and in particular, uh, your perspective on sustainable business models. I think for, for those of you that are not aware, Steve works directly with lots of businesses and also lots of researchers and, and academics and innovators. So I think it's great to hear your perspective on how can some of these kind of sustainable business model approaches, in particular circular economy, um, apply to the Alpine regions? Do you see um, a kind of immediate um, way that that could be a, a kind of perspective that's important and useful? And it'd be interesting to hear your, your general thoughts on that. Uh, thank you. I'm not an expert on sustainable Alpine tourism but we work with hundreds of companies, cities, locations to help them develop their sustainable strategies and in particular their sustainable business models. I did supervise a PhD about 15 years ago on sustainable tourism in Nepal. I believe it's maintenance. Interesting. But, but <laughs> the world has changed. I was just thinking about it. I was thinking, wouldn't, wouldn't everybody want to read it? But you wouldn't. The world was so naive ten, even 10 years ago. And even in the period of COVID, people's attitude towards sustainability, towards resilience has dramatically changed. What is going to come out of this period? I hope we can be really positive about it, can be a positive dynamic, even with all of the horror that we're living through at the moment. Mm -hmm. So let's not go looking 10 years ago, let's make our own future. And part of that would be developing sustainable business models. I'm going to try and talk about what we've learned, about what works and what doesn't, if you want to create sustainable business models. I don't just want to say there is an answer because there isn't one answer. Circular economy is a likely major trend, but it isn't the only one. So what we've learned is how do people go about reflecting on their place, on their business, on themselves, and conduct that reflection in a way that allows them to design new types of value exchange in the future. So there are lots of tools out there. We've even built our own in Cambridge. Of course, they're the better ones, I would say. <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about the tools today. I'm going to talk about those lessons that we learn. You know, we're really often, we're sitting with people in a room online and they are struggling. They have a desire to do something better and different but they don't quite know how to go about it. So let me just randomly and in a slightly unstructured way, draw on that experience. Uh, we help people analyze failed value exchange. So when you look around you at the moment and you look at the whole system, not just your relationship with your direct customer, but the people who aren't your customers, the people who are neighbors, uh, the planet, the region, what is it that you're failing to exchange today? And this is a really important insight because that is usually enough information to design a future value exchange. So you've got to broaden the number of stakeholders and you've sort of got to look ne negatively about how you're doing it at the moment. And that's how the, t the best tools work. I'm going to say that in this economy, the experience economy, as we call it, is going to grow as a percentage of income. Yes, we sell very directly services. So you sell a meal, you sell a hotel room for a night, but selling experiences is always part of that and will become a more dominant part of it. I think it's really interesting to pick up on your mention of intergenerational dynamic in family businesses. Um, it is both a positive and through my observation, in fact, in Austria, uh, with families, that the younger generation are also polite and struggle to make some of these points well heard. 
So there's a really interesting, potentially positive dynamic there if we can give that generation the right tools uh, to hold a very sensible conversation. Uh, you know, we are talking about mountains today. I used to be in the mountain rescue team. I'm a bit of a mountain man myself. I don't know how many of you have seen a picture of the famous Patagonia advert, don't buy this jacket. They only ever put it up once. That is a seriously good marketing dollar, right? Because the rest of us put it into our PowerPoint. And the message I want to be is take risk, be first. Nobody, other people can become best, but only you can be first. And we all look to Patagonia in part because they are unbelievably brilliant at positioning themselves here. I'm going to answer my own question. What are we seeing that future customers will expect really soon? And they expect it really soon. And if you can deliver it now, then that's a bonus. They're going to expect circular, they're going to expect local, and they're going to expect non-toxic. Where do we feel that the most? We feel it in food. We feel it in transport. So people would not want to, you know, electric buses, no brainer. People can see that or see that it's not happening. We have already seen a very quick and rapid change in people's attitudes to single use plastic, for example. And we're going to see some of those other changes coming through. Um, before I dressed for this lovely conference, I was wearing a fleece made from bottles. I was wearing running shoes made from mycelium, from fungus. I was wearing a belt made from fire hose. I'm a sort of recycled man. And <laughs> that's going to be normal. And they are high quality items. Surely we can apply our brain to giving people the absolute best quality and they will pay. The belt, if you make a, if you make a handbag out of fire hose, you pay zero pence cents for your raw material, but you sell it for 300 euros because it's got a story. My handbag used to save lives. Nobody else has that story. No, right? and I love Elvis and Cressy for that. I think they're amazing. At and I think as, a, as, that an example, as an example, all of a sudden it makes you think, wow, wait a minute, I can think of ideas like that. And that's the point. Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Everybody in this room can think of ideas like that if you have the right tools and a couple of the right starter questions. Last couple of points. Big changes that are coming are one, there's going to be a bigger and bigger and bigger emphasis on well-being. Business are going to have to deliver well-being. If you learn how to deliver that well, profit will come second, not the other way around. Don't try to design your business to deliver profit in, then try to deliver well-being. We're going to see that switch happening. Resilience is a really big part of strategic conversations at the moment for very obvious reasons, but it should have been happening earlier. I really love the comment from uh, the emphasis in Plan T on place-based plans rather than company plans. Towns and regions can have interaction between actors that individual actors can't deliver themselves. And my last comment, we are seeing the rise of using a very particular approach that we call asset-based strategies. So what are your assets? Your assets are things that are unique, other people find very difficult to copy, or things you have a lot of. You might have a lot of beds in a shoulder season, you might have a lot of air, you might have a lot of food waste. But when you write down a list of things you have a lot of, it's a little bit like the Friday night fridge problem. You know, when, <laughs> you, when you go to the fridge on Friday night, you have to make a meal of whatever is in there. Now, if I tell you that in your region you have a lot of things, what can you make with it? All of a sudden, interesting things happen, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. I think every time you speak, I'm just in awe at the kind of incredible directions that you can take us in, and and the level of ambition, and and um, and also just making us realise that it's possible. I think so many of the um, narratives around the climate crisis and climate action feel so removed from what we can actually do sometimes and I think you always just bring us down to a level that gives us hope um, 
and and really inspires us and, and that takes me perfectly onto Gavin actually because I think he's an amazing example of somebody that has taken many of the aspects that you speak about in terms of using assets that are available, um, being the first, um, having a very strong vision and I think his Friday night fridge is, is definitely a great concept um, that I think Gavin just completely embodies in, in the business that he's created. So Gavin, I wanted to um, ask you actually to explain a little bit about that practically. Um, I know that you've uh, set up an incredible circular hub shop, which actually does many of the things that um, Steve just mentioned. So can you explain to us a bit about what that is, the journey that you've been on, um, and kind of in, in a quick five minutes go through why community involvement in particular has been really important to you creating um, the Fix It shops? Yeah, sure. There's a lot to rattle through in five minutes, Richard, but I'll, I'll try and keep <laughs> it quite, quite quick. Um, I set up a not-for-profit called One Tree at a Time, which actually operates out in the French Alps in the Courcheval region. Um, and we set up two years ago working with the local community to provide a pledge system for businesses um, and to buy, provide a service for locals. So part of, part of One Tree at a Time uh, and part of its beginning was the recycling and repairing of ski clothing. Um, the other sort of angle that we work for and work on is working with local businesses to improve their environmental footprint through a pledge system. Um, so we ran that for about a year, it was uh, really successful. And recently we just opened a physical space, which is a shop, um, but we like to think of it as a sort of community hub. Uh, and we actually managed to open it during the lockdown and we've been running it now for three months. It's completely self-funding um, and it's working really, really well. The sort of main purpose of the physical space is for education, really. That's how we look at it. That's why we try not to look at it as a shop. Um, when you enter the space, there's a huge big desk at the front. Um, it's got sewing machines on it. Uh, so we run fix it classes. We teach in the local community how to repair their clothing, um, how to look after their clothing and their ski products. Um, and then we also run, run some sort of web, um, sorry, run some sort of workshops based around the pledge system we've created. Um, what keeps it funded is the physical shop space, and that's made up of recycled and repaired clothing. So we've partnered up with various brands. We've partnered up with Planks, um, Untracked, Isobar, um, and they donate their warranty kit to us. We repair it and then we sell it on. Um, and that's been like really successful and really helpful in funding the whole space. But most recently, we've also partnered up with some uh, companies more locally and that's the ski schools and some of the chalet company brands so what happens is the chalet company brands or the ski schools they donate they use ski gear um, often it's in very 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 good condition uh, we actually cover up the logos um, and then we sell that back on um, so we get that back out into our local community we are just about to launch something related to that which is a rental program so we received this kit and we're trying to think right what's the best sort of truly circular sort of product that we can develop like i kind of understand that when we receive a, an item of clothing and we repair it that we're not really fixing the problem we're just sort of prolonging it for a little bit longer like it's going to get used for a longer period of time but it's still going to get to the end of its life um so what we started to do now is we cover up the logos on the ski gear um, and we're launching a rental um service in the local region so that people can come away they can get into skiing at an affordable price but we can make sure we use these materials to the to their fullest. Um, any other questions about the shop at all, Sarisha, and all space? Uh, you're, you're good. You're, it's, go for it. No, I think it's amazing. I, I find you so inspiring because I think you're you're such a brilliant example of where you've kind of taken something which ordinarily someone may see as waste and and actually uh, a problem that people don't even realize about the educational involvement of the community and sustainability and i think i'm so excited to to see where that journey goes with you because i think you you and your team are really at the forefront of that kind of model and and i think there's so many regions that could learn from that um and yeah, I think I can't thank you enough for being part of that journey. And I, I think we, we'll definitely um, be able to talk a bit more in, in the, the next kind of brief question about where you see that going this year in particular. Um, so yeah, I think it's it's fantastic. And, and every time we speak, I'm thinking of a thousand ideas after I'd that like we need to, to uh, catch up on. 
I'd like to say there's some sort of strategy, but basically we've we've looked in our region, we've looked in that area. Um, I'm actually a small business owner, so I own two two boot fitting shops here in the Alps, one in Corsfell and one in Maribel. Um, and this whole process started from us just looking at how we could change the the impact of our physical shops. Um, and then it's just grown from there in the last two years until to, to what it is now where we're servicing the local community and lots of small businesses that operate around us. Um, but yeah. Um, the education point is critical. I think that the SDGs agenda frames a lot of the, the narratives of where we need to go. And I think in what you're doing with the educational part of the shop, you're sort of moving into, like Steve said, the experience based economy, which is, is quite critical. Um, I'm conscious of the time and, and we're going to move to Q&A in about kind of 10 to 15 minutes or so. So do get your questions in via the chat, everybody. Um, I'm going to go back to Carolina, Carolina sorry, to, to talk a bit more about the SDGs agenda. Um, and I know we're, we're quite tight on time, so it might have to be a quick three minutes on this one, if that's OK. But um, I just wondered, in terms of the SDG agenda, how do you see that being relevant in the mountain context? I feel like everything that the other speakers have said have sort of touched upon elements of the SDGs. So how important do you think those are, Carolina, for, for looking at the solutions going forward in particular? Thanks very much for, for that question. Uh, just to be very brief, I think what the SDGs uh, allow us to do uh, is to be able to monitor, monitor and track progress towards the many sustainability aspirations and goals that we are uh, subscribed to uh, under the SDG umbrella. I think focusing um, too much on the indicators and indices as an end in themselves really limits our um, possibility to, to, in fact, have a much more inclusive and reflexive um, opportunity to look at whether we are tracking towards sustainability in a broader sense. So I think looking at the SDGs as a means to an end is, is important. And one particular thing that is also key to consider, especially from a mountains perspective, the SDGs are really there for um, design for member states at the national level to uh, report on how they are tracking along those goals and, and indicators. Now, mountains are transboundary in many cases. Uh, the Alps, for example, all, all of the countries involved in the Alps, Alpine space uh, are many, and therefore the key issues of sustainability that are crucial to maintain um, the integrity, I guess, of the mountain space, also for future generations, absolutely requires uh, the collaboration with uh, those uh, um, other countries in a transboundary sense. So just focusing on the SDG progress in one country um, without connecting to the progress being made in other countries is insufficient in, in a mountain context. So I think that's also important to consider when thinking about how we look at the results within the SDG framework. That's amazing. I think you've covered a, a real um, breadth of topics in terms of where that SDG agenda needs to go at the local knowledge sharing level. For anyone that's interested, it's definitely worth checking out the mountain, the MRI's um, Sustainable Mountain Development for Global Change Initiative, which was run um, for the last four years. And I think that's got some really interesting research as well behind that. So I'd encourage you all to, to have a look at Caroline's LinkedIn and, and try and connect through on, on some of those. Um, this takes me nicely to Ingrid, actually, because I think um, in what you just said, Caroline, you mentioned quite importantly that that local perspective is required. And and Ingrid, if, um, in, a, in a kind of three three minutes or so, I wonder if you could explain the climate energy model regions work that the Austrian government's currently doing, because I think that's a great example of where you're trying to take those global slash federal solutions and bring them to a really local level to actually get um, potentially even a, a bottom up perspective on on what's required at, at that local level. Yes, uh, of course. Uh, so the Austrian government has uh, launched the climate and energy program uh, 10 years ago. And actually, uh, the aim of the program is to develop uh, and, and support climate and energy model regions. Uh, and this year, uh, our tourism ministry uh, launched a special call for tourism regions to become climate friendly regions uh, through this program. So uh, there were uh, the regions, uh, tourism regions could apply. Uh, it was a competition and they had to present a roadmap 
with at least 10 implementation measures uh, in the fields of energy saving, energy resource efficiency, sustainable mobility solutions, um, regional value added, uh, etc. And uh, they also had uh, to have a regional um, energy and climate manager for this program. And uh, so this was in the first stage and three tourism destinations uh, now went through this, uh, were selected in the first stage. And uh, now the second stage is ongoing. Uh, and uh, we will see in a few weeks, I think the winner will be announced. They will get a budget of 1 million euro and they will have two to three years time to implement their measures. So they will really become a model tourism, sustainable tourism region uh, to act as a flagship project for other regions to motivate them and uh, to show them it is feasible to have climate and energy friendly tourism. Amazing. And I think what's really interesting in that is that it is kind of almost quite grassroots in terms of the policy implementation. Um, and I think that's something that people don't often think about in terms of the pathway of policy to actually create change. Um, and I'm really, I think having the discussions with you and your colleagues was really interesting to learn about that um, potential solution um, tool really it's kind of a competition but it, it brings a, a real um localized narrative which potentially improves the uh actual success of, of some of those solutions so yeah thank you so much for sharing that um steve i think uh my original questions kind of gone out of the water to be honest because i think in in everything that we've just said and and what you mentioned earlier i think there's a real question of how do we actually encourage that kind of knowledge sharing so you mentioned quite a lot about the idea of the um the kind of storytelling narrative and and ensuring that we do get um people and entrepreneurs and, and business leaders and, and innovators to think in that way. But what it what's missing to like foster those dialogues? Is there something, for example, Sati, that you think we could do to kind of improve that process? I'd love to hear your perspective on on where the gap is and, and how we kind of address that. Uh, Steve, are you there? Uh, oh, this is a second. I did not unmute. Ah, okay. <laughs> Let me very briefly talk about where I see the big innovation spaces coming from in the future. And this is not restricted to Alpine, but it does have very particular uh, meaning. We, I'm expecting a really big emphasis on restorative soil systems. So we worry about climate change. We worry about air quality. We worry about... Um, biodiversity and those other things, soil quality is what will kill the human race. If you don't have effective soil systems, you will have problems. And I don't know where the expertise is on alpine soil systems, but I encourage you to go and engage with them because they're going to have important knowledge. Local making is going to be really important. Um, so really, Gavin, fantastic example, right? Uh, let me give you a uh, a project that we were doing with a very famous uh, running clothing company. We were going to put a shop up in Oxford Street in London, which allowed you to bring your favorite running T-shirt. Typically, that's something that's made of polyester. And we had the technology to break that back down to a monomer level and build it back up to polymers. And then we could build a new T-shirt out of your old T-shirt. But that new T-shirt, if you wanted, would be able to hold the route maps of your favorite marathons that you'd run in that shirt. So you get a personalized object made from the molecules that you'd already worn on those marathons. The technology is allowing us to go in that direction so we can think really hard about what does local making mean in the future. Um, I'm really excited about the fact that well-being has been mentioned by others. I work on a program with outdoor teachers where we help teenagers better understand what we call true north in, in using the compass as a metaphor for life. One of my greatest frustrations, I took the idea to the UK government, we need to have half the number of kids in each classroom during COVID. 
why don't we get the other half outdoors where it's safer and there's a whole yeah. bunch of teachers which can prepare them for other battles of life. And you know what? We're not doing it, right? We still mm. think school is something that happens in a building. This is mm. just an enormous frustration from my part. You ask the question, really important question about how to scale. And I've only got three points. One is a planning for resilience is really important, a new dimension to this. But the most important dimension is experimenting. Make it a habit. Learn how to experiment in a safe way. It, the more often you do it, the more regular it becomes, the less risky it feels emotionally. How do we reduce the risk? We share experiments. So we share the risk of a failed experiment by not doing it in only one business, typically. Mm. Um, and then the sense of place becomes really important in encouraging experiments. How do we do that? Stories are really important. Write your own story. Write your own future story. I think we've got to be much better at pointing to our heroes. <laughs> and actually, if we're going to have stories, we like people. So you, you can center effectively sustainable alpine tourism stories around people because that's what mm. people want to hear about. So Person X is doing this exciting thing. Of course, Person X didn't do it on their own. Mm. But I'd like Person X to be a local hero. And I think we need local hero programs. And then everybody wants to copy. And I'm finished. I think that's given me so much food for thought in terms of the, the plan for this year on the local heroes front. I think all of a lot of people on this call today are definitely my local heroes, maybe not locally to London, but locally to, to the idea of the community that we're trying to build. And I think I'll, I'll definitely take that on board as well from, from the side of how to develop um, the project, because I think that people relate to people. Um, and I think that's that's quite a critical point. Um, I'm going to just quickly move to Gavin um, to close before we open the Q&A. And, and please do definitely put um, things in the, the chat function in terms of questions for the, the panel. So Gav, um, there's there's a lot that we've covered today, obviously. Um, and actually, I should mention that on on the boot shop um, that Gavin has, he actually took uh, some interesting technology from a different sector and made a uh, a shoe um, mold from uh, cork. Actually, so I think that experimentation's been something quite interesting in your business as well, Gav. I know historically, but I wondered um, in terms of the action gap. So there's obviously a lot of things that are required in the coming few months slash years ahead. Um, and I just wanted your perspective on like, do you think there is an action gap? How can we address that? I know you're doing a lot to address it, but what can everybody on the call kind of learn learn from you on that front? Um, and it, it was covered in, Gavin's got an amazing series of Citizens of Winter as well. Um, connect with him on LinkedIn and you can find it, but it's definitely worth listening to because I think many of those local heroes are, are also on that. Cool. I'll just touch on one real quick thing that Steve mentioned about stories, quick discussion, and uh, an experience we've had with clothing. So we received clothing from brands. Um, we've done an event where we did a fix it event outside one of the brand shops. So we take this clothing, we repair it, and we resell it. We put a badge on it, put a one tree badge on it. Um, I was reselling it outside their shop for more than that jacket would have costed inside the shop. So even though we'd taken it, we'd repaired it. We stuck a stamp on there. It was less waterproof, for example, because we'd repaired a zip, um, but we could actually sell it for more than you could have gone and bought a new product inside. So there's definitely some truth in that. Um, as for the action gap, um, I would say from my experience of trying to put my actions into action in the boot lab in trying to change my business, um, the most difficult barrier to start with was just getting ready and getting going, like just getting some action started and i think what we've seen around here is because we create a pledge system for businesses it gave them a really quick and easy route into taking action so they could just tick the pledges that they thought they could do we then give them a handbook and training and then they could start on on these pledges without that sort of system and that framework in place it's really really hard to start um, and i think what's important for the alpine industry is we have a sort of system and framework that is built around this industry and also built around the particular um, businesses within the industry. So if you're talking about Austrian hotels, mm -hmm. surely you can put in a really good framework for how you could run the most eco-friendly 
um, or sustainable sustainable Austri Austrian hotel immediately, and everyone can just start following those steps. Um, that would be my takeaway on that. It's the kind of getting started um, and having the resources and the the, the education and the, to get going, really. And also the the courageousness of one's imagination, right? Like I think that's what's really interesting whenever I speak to you and Steve and many of the people around this table or virtual table is that essentially you all have this kind of attitude that nothing's impossible when you come to some of the solutions that are required. I know that when I first started SETI, everyone thought it was quite crazy to come up with a conference and now I'm an economist, like where did this come from? But actually I think that Often it just requires us to step outside of that comfort zone and kind of try, experiment, learn, have the humility to kind of work with others that we may know nothing about, to be honest. Um, and I think, yeah, it's really exciting to see where that journey takes us this year, because I think we're obviously all doing that digitally, but it doesn't mean that we can't create solutions that are actually on the ground and, and working and impactful um, and addressing many of those action gaps, even if it is a knowledge gap, a storytelling gap, um, a gap around awareness of some of these solutions. I think that's going to be really critical. Um, so I'm going to quickly go into Q&A and we've got uh, probably about five minutes on Q&A. I can see a couple of questions coming in the chat as well and, and lots of positive, uh, positive feedback back for our panelists so thank you everyone for that um, the first question is from Kelly um, who's actually a specialist on climate risk as well for anyone that doesn't know um, but Kelly was wondering about um, how you actually um, map the shirt like is it nanotechnology like what kind of technology did you use Steve in that process to to um, to actually create that really boring just printing but you can also you can also um, if so one of the possibilities, uh, sorry, am I on mute? No, no, we can hear you. Sorry. Um, one of the possibilities we were looking at is in the marathon running world, people like to uh, sort of signal in a slightly polite way just quite how many they've done. So one of the <laughs> possibilities is that you just have a stripe of a different color for each marathon that you've done. Um, so that could become an internal language of that community. Um, if you, you know, if you've done 22 black runs, have 22 black stripes, and that's not printing, that can be brought in through the, the fiber color dyeing system. So lots of really interesting opportunities for personalizing and making people associate with the molecule not the garment. It's like, this is my molecule. I'll wear this for 40 years, but it will become different garments is an interesting uh, story, I suppose, that we're, we're trying to make happen. That's really interesting because in what you say there about customization, it really goes back to the personal storytelling that somebody has to connect with um, something of value to them. It came up actually in the discussion that we had, and I'd encourage you all to check it out on the YouTube channel in December around travel as well, because I think often this storytelling is really vital to the whole experience that somebody might have, whether it's choosing gear for a holiday or how they travel to a resort or how they actually spend time in, in nature. That storytelling narrative and connecting them to sustainability to to be honest to make it cool is actually quite a powerful force looking at the coming years ahead um, and I think yeah that's that's really great to hear that that's something that worked really effectively um, in the project that you worked on Steve. I think Gavin there's also a question for you around the the training concept um, or more so just kind of understanding a bit more about that and and how that's working I guess in the fix-it shops is that something that you see kind of uh as as quite a core cool part like what's what's been an interesting takeaway from yeah. the training aspects uh, this is the best part to be honest um we so we have some seamstresses that come in and teach fix it classes so uh they do that both for adults and children um so they just teach how we can repair clothing how we can extend the lifetime of clothing uh interestingly last week which is pretty exciting we've been contacted by the council and the hope savoir to go and do this in the schools as well um so we're just That's working amazing. out a, uh, a program to do that and hopefully you're going to come out in the summer swisher and and run an event with us as well <laughs> if we're allowed yeah to. so I think that's great. I think it's 
I honestly think that this education awareness raising piece is just such a critical part. And I think, you know, my own background is economics and, and now moved into sustainability communication. And I see that there's just this huge need to share knowledge across different industries and stakeholder types. You know, I've often gone into meetings with corporate executives that have, to be honest, been there for the last 30 odd years. And who am I to tell them something that you know, they could be doing to their business. But actually, that's totally what's required if we're going to move things forward. We have to kind of step outside into those arenas where we might not currently engage and, and bring a new narrative. And I think it's amazing to hear that you're doing that in that's schools. Good. Can I can I pile in on that? Gavin? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, firstly, Danny, thank you for your story. In in the um in the chat, if you can look at it, doing a cross-country ski marathon, seeing another competitor wearing multiple racing bibs that had been sewn together to make a shirt. You remembered that and you thought, if I had the time, I'd do that. Well, you need to go to Gavin Seamstresses, right? <laughs> um, so Gavin, I understand you got your degree in Huddersfield. We were working in Leeds. Okay. Um, in what might be the biggest clothing shop in Leeds? And we brought the Women's Institute and sewing machines into the shop. They were not meant to help people sell any clothing in the shop. And we thought that the shop manager would be really unhappy because they're lo losing square meters. And what we actually got was the shop manager was ecstatic because the energy in the room, the energy in the shop changed. Now that means they sold more stuff. We've got to be a bit careful about unintended consequences, but it points to the power of interaction between ourselves and our garments, rather than being distant purchases of things that sit on racks. And I think there's real room for exciting experiences. You're going to walk away and remember that. That's mm. That's part of your holiday experience that you take home. Yeah, I've been, um, I'm a believer because the, the shops I run, my day-to-day -day job is a boot fitting shop. And the only reason that works is because there's tons of servicing attached. Like I, there's no way I could have a shop that just sold a ski boot. We make custom made footbeds, we fit them. Um, and that's the same for the fix it shops. They're about service that I try to really not think of them as a shop. I try to think of them as a place where you can educate, you can learn, you can get something fixed, you can get something repaired. And personally, I believe in the future, that's how the high street can have a reinvigorate, reinvigoration. Like that's how it can stand out when you compare it to the internet. It can deliver so much more. Like it can, it can turn your running t-shirt into a new t-shirt that you can continue to win 40 years. And I mean, that's great. Yep. And I can see some, some fascinating conversations coming in on the chat around um, some of the potential kind of hurdles that could be fixed so Simona and Simona's amazing I encourage you all to connect with Simona so Simona's a good friend of mine on the course at Cambridge um, and she's also an expert on sustainable fashion um, and circular economy just wrote a thesis on that um, but the interesting question is around um, is there an opportunity to develop some of those recycling technologies in Europe so that the supply chains can become more seamless in circularity? And it sort of ties a bit nicely to George's question around um, how can some of the larger um, businesses actually scale that within their operations? Um, especially if, in fact, that's an interesting point, George, because it, you talk about transition industries to some extent there um, on harmful business models. So yeah, I guess um, I'll leave that quite open. Maybe it's maybe it's a question, um, Steve, on your side from, from the businesses that you work with. And then, of course, um, uh, feel free to chip in any of the rest of the panel as well. I think that one of the dilemmas of being a large business is that if somebody comes along and pioneers and experiments, um, it can throw the rest of your business into sort of dark relief. It can go, well, if you've got this, why are you still doing that? The truth is that people see you as pioneering, but that's not what leaders fear. They, they fear that they will be pushed. If it's successful, they will be pushed to change the entirety of the business within two quarters. Um, actually, that's a good thing, but they're scared of it for obvious reasons of fear of change uh, in general and fear of not being in control of the future. Uh, so in our experience, large companies struggle with this. And so mm. when they do do experiments, they put them in weird corners 
you know we're going to, we're going to do this in the store that's in you know northwest cambridge so that only three people ever find out because if it <laughs> works if it works we don't want our customers demanding it everywhere smaller businesses don't have that fear because they're looking for an edge and if they run an experiment and see an edge they are willing to make the move to doing things in new ways but smaller businesses are more fragile they have less resources behind them they don't have hundreds of millions of dollars access to bank loans so how do we get small businesses to experiment and support the experimenting phase because the implementation phase is easier for them mm -hmm. And I think that's, I'm, I'm going to sort of slightly direct to Carolina, actually, because I'd be interested to hear, Carolina, your thoughts on where that experimentation could go with working with academia. Because obviously you've got a lot of researchers as part of the MRI, and is that something that you think we'll see going forward, these kind of joint experimentation um, incubators that then scale up, or, or where do you see that experimentation? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think I could have said it any better. I think my colleague uh, nailed it very well. And I can see many parallels also to the academic world, the hesitancy sometimes to, to experiment. Um, and that is also given um, the funding culture uh, of, of many funding organizations that they themselves don't necessarily take the risks uh, needed for us to try blue sky ideas and, and, and really try this out. Um, there's also a big challenge I see with regards to uh, early career researchers who are often um, uh, very much uh, constrained by, uh, by the needs and, and the structures that are set up around academia for, for them to get tenure, for example, uh, to become professors is extremely competitive. And sometimes you have to follow very conservative ways of conducting research and experimenting just to stay in the system, which again, mm. uh, limits innovation quite dramatically. Um, so I would certainly uh, see opportunities to uh, um, provide, um, I guess, resources and opportunities also for early career researchers to, to take those risks and uh, those experiments to be acknowledged as part of the knowledge creation system. I think these are, these are incremental, sometimes small steps uh, that provide huge amounts of insights. Uh, we don't need necessarily a huge uh, uh, multi-scale research project to try ideas out. Sometimes seed funding to a small idea is sufficient just to get the ball rolling and for people to gain experience um, and develop uh, capacities also to connect with others uh, to learn from that. Um, so there are also some uh, risks, of course, associated with that, as, as my colleague has already mentioned from the business perspective. Um, but this is certainly something that we would uh, look to promote, uh, certainly from an MRI, to be able to advocate, uh, especially for funding organisations, to recognise the value of uh, doing research differently and engaging with others outside of academia is also important for that. Amazing. And I think um, I feel very lucky with the, the Cambridge group, actually, because I think we all had a, a real thirst for the applied research. And I think the the, the work that um, Steve mentioned as well is a really interesting zone for that. Um, and I think um, I'm conscious of time, so we're going to move to to introduce the facilitators. But I think um, just touching briefly upon what you said about experimentation, I think, Ingrid, the initiative that you mentioned from the Austrian government is quite interesting in that respect, in terms of the experimentation and, and working on um, regional narratives at a competition level, because I think that creates it's a different dynamic in terms of those power structures that Carolina just mentioned. So I'm going to quickly introduce our facilitators um, and give them the floor for a minute um, before we go into the breakout rooms. Just to let you guys know, the way that those work um, is that on the screen, um, after I've given Jim and, and Pamela the floor, you'll basically see a button that says join. And if you click that, you'll be taken to a breakout room that's run by um, one of us. Uh, and essentially, you'll we'll, we'll be delving a bit more into some of the themes that we've we've just discussed. So, um, Jim, I'm just going to hand over to you to say a quick hello and, and introduce yourself and, and Pamela the same, and, and then we'll start the breakout room. Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Jim. Um, so I'm a researcher at university, um, but I also collaborate with um, a circular economy group in, in Milan. So I'm trying to also try to step outside more of the university. And um, that was kind of what my, my PhD research was looking into as well as uh, besides the idea of community development, but the role of uh, community-based community organizations and research groups. 
Um, so, and really looking to carry out actual meaningful research, not just some of the traditional research you see from, from universities. And so that, and that's what I'm trying to develop now, like a small, a small project and looking at, I think, as Risha mentioned it before, the, the role of accommodations is more, more than just accommodation, more of these kind of hybrid places between learning, research, and also taking action and in, in being examples of, of places of um, circular economy principles and similar principles. And so, yeah, I'm going to try to work on that for now. And um, we're looking to look at this, this role of community-based tourism and creating these strong, stronger links between um, the tourist and the local communities. Amazing. Thank you. And Pamela, um, just quickly the same with you as well, and then we'll move into the breakout rooms where you can all have a bit more of a dialogue um, for about 20, 20 minutes or so. Sure. So hi, everyone. My name is Pamela. Um, what I usually do as a living is um, I work what I call as a fractional chief sustainability officer with small and medium enterprises in consumer products. I do have a history in textiles and outdoor goods um, where I've worked for a number of years, hence sort of the link to what's happening here, Bournemouth, Switzerland, the Alps around the corner in offset there. Um, and the other side I usually do is work with corporate boards. Um, helping them along understanding what the whole sustainability agenda is all about. Um, and again, a lot of small and medium enterprises, their family owned businesses and hence where the overlap is. So that's how you start and I got to talk. Amazing. Thank you so much. And I think you'll definitely all have, have a chance to interact now in the breakout rooms. Just to let you know, after the breakout rooms, we will go back into this main room for a quick five minute reflection time, um, probably at half past. So um, do join for the last five minutes and, and stay on the call and we'll just have a quick reflection time. And I'll also be telling you about what the plan is for the rest of the year with Sati. Um, so Dan, if we could just open the breakouts, that would be great. And if everyone can just click join, um, you'll be taken to one of the rooms. So I'm going to invite the other facilitators to give a quick um, kind of two minute reflection on, on your thoughts of your session. I know we're overrunning slightly, um, but we'll probably be finishing the session in around five minutes for anyone that's got any subsequent meetings or, or things to attend after. Um, I guess, um, Pamela, can I invite you to reflect uh, for a quick um, minute and a half on, on your group and, and what the key thoughts were from that discussion? Sure. So we've um, talked about the community aspect and there were a couple of points that we started to realize, which is, first of all, what does community really mean? Um, so there are areas that don't have, that are really big industrialized, they lost their personality and others they haven't. Um, one thing is a bit more conductive to being a, a community in that sense, also embedded or not in national context. So big industrialized sometimes have a totally just outside view meaning international guests which again impacts of, of how community is defined um we've mentioned it a bit before but it's like there's the the role of those that come for the season and how they you know clock into what the local life is but not just do it but are invited to do so and are committed to do so and and realize that they're not just there to take away but also to give back um, and then there is a point of a certain character of skier or attendee to those um, resorts that because of wealth and because they can have just been voraciously consuming so far. And there's a big question mark on how will that turn out um, for COVID eventually? Will we see a replication of that or will there be a shift in that attitude? And, what kind of people will actually go back to resorts, the same characters as before, or will there a shift in that will clock better with that local engagement as well? That's really interesting. And I think in it's quite a diverse perspective to some extent to, to what was said in the group that I was I was uh, in. So Jim, I'll, I'll, I'll hand the floor to you to reflect a bit on on um, your perspective as well. Um, you yeah. could share with us. And, and thank you so much, Pamela. I think that's given me a lot to think about in terms of the the next session in particular and, and localization in February. Uh, okay, so I guess one of the, the main things we talked about was which ed education and awareness, and and with that comes the just about the the language that you use and and really reaching um, these different types, these different communities, these different places that 
even within, say, uh, in a in a region that even each dip, each different village needs a different mess might need a different message, might need a different language used. So we said that using the like a very just being very very uh, across a very simple message and mm -hmm. that one can understand and like uh, you're saying that even the word sustainability that some of these some people don't really know what it is and, and how do you how are you sustainable if you don't mm -hmm. know but even if you don't know what it is you can just you know some people can still be you know using these principles and you know they don't, they don't know if they're being sustainable and then we also talked about kind of how how broad the word is and and how it's just being used everywhere now and um so that was kind of worrying in, in one sense as well um maybe it needs to be more defined and mm -hmm. um yeah things like that and what else we talk about oh and it's just maybe just look more into to this seeing how it's 2021 there's not really a solution to, to covid yet and mm -hmm. Really focusing on, yeah, I think we've talked about this before, just really focus on the, the local tourism and, and staying in your own backyard and exploring what you have and not trying to, if you can't, not trying to go too far. And, and uh, yeah, amazing. So I think there's there's a lot of um, overlaps to some extent with, with some of the things we discussed in, in the group that I was in as well. I think one thing that was really clear was that um, there's there's definitely this. Uh, needs an understanding of the balance between sustainability and profitability people think that the two can't go hand in hand but that's not necessarily true at all um i think the fragmented market came up as a potential hurdle um in terms of the structure of many uh, mountain region resorts and and towns in particular um and i think the one of the things that was quite interesting was the role of community managers and what they can actually do to try to get local stakeholder buy-in um one critical thing that was mentioned quite a lot in that in our group was the role of community workshops and why that's really essential to get that kind of grassroots innovation and also sustained um innovation rather than just kind of one-shot solutions that might be quite removed from a local implementation i think the the community manager role seemed quite critical and that was actually something that the the austrian government implemented on the policy discussion as well and um two final things one was really interesting the Himalaya context so we had a, um, a great person um, Supriya joining from um, India as well and um, who mentioned that actually the Himalaya context is quite interesting because there there's a lot of other sustainable development issues which might not necessarily be prevalent in mountain regions in Europe for example access to electricity um, even looking at um, the the kind of food um, security and lots of things like that. So I think what's critical is to understand the local nature of the issues and then find the right sustainability pathways to try to address those. Um, and finally, really interesting point from from Steve was around the cognitive um, personal behaviour um, impact and, and why that as a factor is quite important so actually making it look like there's momentum around uh mobilizing certain stakeholders is actually really useful to get a wider buy-in and i think i noticed that a lot in austria in the project when it first started because initially there was a kind of oh just speak to the tourism board and then when i got a lot of different stakeholders on board suddenly there was a momentum that started to build and more of a trust around actually working together on this issue i think so many uh stakeholders work at a pre-competitive level which is very difficult when we're trying to address sustainability and i think going forward that's actually one of the things that is really required is this kind of collaboration to build that momentum i'm conscious of the time so i'm just going to spend a really quick 10 seconds plugging the rest of um the agenda for 2021 this is very new haven't shared this um outside of the the team yet um but essentially in terms of the the key topics that we're looking at for february we're going to be addressing localization and looking at some of the solutions that are quite critical at the local level and that's going to be across lots of different mountain regions uh we're doing an innovation showcase in march so that's going to be a kind of quick um very quick sessions around different uh, solutions that are being implemented across the different uh industries that we've addressed through sati results of the future will be april and that's looking at this um balance between um the the resiliency strategies and also engagement with the community youth engagement may june more 
on the impact measurement and the practical strategies to do that. And finally, um, towards the end or middle of the year, sorry, we're looking at taking SATI on tour as a hybrid tour. Um, but obviously that remains to be seen with the current coronavirus um, and looking at, at how that plays out. But please do stay tuned in February. Um, connect on the LinkedIn group, the QR codes at the top. If not, just reach out to me and I can send you the invitation to join that group. But yeah, I wanted to thank you all so much for your time today. And I think it's been such a fascinating discussion. I think I, I always feel like every time we, we do a session, I, I not only learn a lot, but I also feel so energized to take this forward and, and collaborate with all of you. So yeah, I just wanted to say a big thank you um, for, for everyone's participation today.